The documents Naomi suggest that Facebook only takes down less than 5% of hate speech at the same time that we've heard Facebook representatives say they have a zero tolerance for this stuff. And also that the algorithm makes it even more difficult to take this stuff down. Walk us through how that's even possible. Yeah, so for quite some time, Facebook has um, been really touting the power of its AI systems to detect hate speech and automatically take down some of it. You'll regularly see Facebook put out statistics that say, um, you know, more than 90% of the hate speech that we take action on was caught by our internal systems before a user reported it to the company. What they have never really detailed is what is the total universe of hate speech on the platform that it is or isn't taking action on? And what some of the documents suggest is that um, Facebook is only taking action on, on less than 5%. Um, and so what we're seeing is it's just a story of, of different statistics. Um, and, and the ones revealed by the documents are, are certainly far more dire. We've been listening into Facebook's earnings call. Mark Zuckerberg just said that he believes these documents, the revelations of Francis Haugen, paint a false picture of the company. Take a listen to what he had to say. My view is that what we are seeing is a coordinated effort to selectively use leaked documents to paint a false picture of our company. Adam, what's your reaction to that, given that these are Facebook's own internal documents, not one in isolation, but thousands and thousands of pages? Yeah, look, I worked in companies, and I don't know that any company I worked in would necessarily love the idea of their internal documents being uh, published. On the other hand, I do think that, you know, looking in the mirror, as these documents do, uh, it's painful, but it can be a useful exercise, and I think it can make the company better. Look, I mean, Facebook is a big, global, important service. It plays a really important role in the lives of its users. The questions about how it handles content and, uh, and other issues are a matter of public importance. But I do think we should treat the revelations with, from the Facebook uh, papers and reporting with um, nuance because, um, you know, I think one of the things that comes through the documents is you see a company trying to balance competing values, right? And they may not always get it right, um, but, uh, but I do think there's value, hopefully, in seeing kind of how others view them. And I think that will ultimately make the company better. Well, and I guess we all wonder if indeed that is the, the effect that this will have. Um, Francis Haugen Naomi also made the case that Facebook prioritizes hate speech in English, and specifically American English, more so than in developing countries and especially countries where they don't speak English. Talk to us about how Facebook's efforts to handle uh, hate speech, misinformation in you know, Western English speaking countries compares to the rest of the world. Well, look, it takes resources and time to not only um, hire individual staffers for, for content moderation <coughs> purposes in these various countries that Facebook is operating. It takes resources to train um, its classifiers to decide what is hate speech and, and, and how, um, you know, at what point should it be flagged to Facebook's internal systems. And you know, what the document suggests is Facebook has prioritized countries in the Western world, and in particular, um, English. There's one document that looks at the time spent, uh, you know, the, of the total time spent training hate speech classifiers um, on the platform, you know, nearly a quarter of it is spent in English. And so you know, that weaves that potentially developing regions and regions that are more vulnerable to offline harms because of online activity, you know, left behind some of the more advanced nations. Now, of course, hate speech, Adam, is not just limited to Facebook. But is this because the line between hate speech and censorship or hate speech and free speech is too hard to draw? Or is this because Facebook in particular is just not doing enough? I think you might see some conservatives making that argument. I know you had David Sachs on last week, and I think he made that argument. Um, despite the fact that I think we tend to view online speech through a partisan prism, uh, Morning Consult had a really interesting survey out two weeks ago where they showed that 70% of voters, which is a very high number, want social media uh, services to have stricter content controls, which I found just really interesting. Uh, and I think it, you probably see the same thing uh, outside the U.S., your question to Naomi about 
international. Um, so should Facebook do more? Absolutely. Should, should all the services do more to uh, reduce the amount of hate and hoaxes and disinformation on their services? Absolutely, because I think that's clearly what their customers want. It's what their advertisers want. Um, and I want to preserve the legal tools, the First Amendment and Section 230 that help them do that. And I think ultimately what, you know, what consumers are saying here is like, we want to have a good experience on your social network. We don't want to be bombarded with junk. And, um, and so, you know, everybody, all the social services can be doing a lot more to, to make that the case. Now, the question remains, what will government do about this? Will the SEC step in? Will lawmakers step in? Will there actually be regulation? I want to take a listen to another thing that Francis Haugen had to say about regulation in particular before UK Parliament. And right now, Facebook doesn't have to solve these problems. It doesn't have to disclose they exist, and it doesn't, need, it doesn't have to come up with solutions. But in a world where they were regulated and mandated, you have to tell us what the five-point plan is on each of these things. And if it's not good enough, we're going to come back to you and ask you again. Um, that's a world where Facebook now has an incentive to, instead of giving 10,000, like investing 10,000 engineers to make the metaverse, we have 10,000 engineers to make us safer. And that's the world we need. Adam, as someone who has worked on the company side for so many years, do you believe regulation is needed and what kind of regulation is needed, especially given the new issues that have come to light through Facebook's own eyes, from its own internal research? Regulation is needed. There are some good ideas out there. We should have a federal comprehensive privacy law, which has been stalled for years. Um, there's a really good piece of legislation by Congressman Raskin from Maryland that would have an NIH study of kids' technology issues. Um, but I also think we need to be careful around, particularly issues around speech. A lot of the criticism that comes Facebook's way right now is really a question of its content moderation decisions, which are, they're making certain decisions about certain types of speech. Most of that is First Amendment protected speech which the company has still you know, made a choice to, to disallow. So the fact is legislation probably can't touch a lot of that. Um, but I also think that you know, we need to make sure that legislation and regulation isn't driven by a desire to get one company or another, because usually when that happens, you end up with collateral impacts on, on smaller services, smaller social networks. And that wouldn't be good for competition, which I think a lot of us want to, to stimulate as well. Indeed. Now, Adam, we, we've been continuing to listen in to the Facebook earnings call. I want you to take a listen to something Mark Zuckerberg uh, just had to say about young users in particular. Take a listen. Over the last decade, as the audience that uses our apps has expanded so much and we focused on serving everyone, our services have gotten dialed uh, to be the best for the most people who use them rather than specifically for young adults. And during this period, competition has also gotten a lot more intense especially with Apple's iMessage growing in popularity, and more recently, the rise of TikTok, which is one of the most effective competitors that we have ever faced. So we are retooling our teams to make serving young adults their North Star. So, Adam, Facebook has made the argument that kids are using technology, whether we like it or not. Somebody has to build that experience for them and make it it's safe. There's, of course, a question of whether we want Facebook to do that for our children. There is a hearing on Capitol Hill tomorrow focused on kids and technology, TikTok, YouTube, um, Snap will be there, there, Facebook will not be there. But what is your view on who should be making this technology? Should it be these big tech companies? Should it be completely different? Should it be a nonprofit effort? Should the business model, uh, you know, driving kids technology be completely different and not something that's necessarily based on engagement or advertising? Look, I have young kids. I like that we have, uh, I have Disney Plus as an option. I've got Amazon Prime, I've got Netflix as an option, and also PBS, the publicly supported option. So I think all of that's great. And frankly, to the extent that there's, you know, an appetite for stimulating more competition um, in kids' technology, I think that's a wonderful thing. Frankly, our laws, particularly the kids' privacy law, has for a long time disincentivized services from building for kids because services were worried about running afoul of the law. I think one of the things you've seen in the last couple of years is services like Facebook, Messenger Kids, um, YouTube Kids, um, Apple's Family Sharing. They're all really good services because they give parents a lot of control. One of the things I just think we need to be more honest about the fact, though, is like when kids hit that tween age, they start kind of chafing at the limits of kid design technology. And so I, I think we just need to study this. That's why my organization is a big supporter of this bill by Congressman Raskin that would 
bring government resources to bear to study this, study how kids are using it. Um, I think parents, this is a tough issue for parents are really struggling with this. And frankly, I don't know that anybody in government is really giving them a very satisfying answer right now.